Hello and welcome to A Brief History of Life, where we'll be quickly exploring life from its dawn to its current condition. But before then, roll the intro. This is not by any stretch of the imagination an easy topic, and in all honesty this script has caused me many bouts of writer's block. The complexity of life on Earth is not one which was ever meant to be summed up in a quick presentation. Therefore it goes without saying that much of this talk will fall into the category of gross generalisation, omitted processes and time jumps. However, in knowing that, Let's start from the beginning. Life began in what is known as the primordial soup through a process called abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is the idea that life arose from non-life more than 3.5 billion years ago on Earth, approximately 1 billion years after the formation of the solar system and including our planet. Abiogenesis proposes that the first life forms generated were very simple and through a gradual process became increasingly complex. Biogenesis, in which life is derived from the reproduction of other life, was presumably preceded by abiogenesis, which became impossible once Earth's atmosphere assumed its present composition. In 1953, Stanley Miller sought out to answer the question of the origins of life on Earth. In his experiment, he used an apparatus with a flask filled with water and chemicals thought to exist on a primitive Earth. What he found was that these chemicals, under the right conditions, spontaneously formed organic molecules. This experiment suggests that organic molecules could have spontaneously formed on the primitive Earth giving way to the first living things. This experiment and subsequent repetitions have suggested that some of these spontaneously generated organic molecules in the early life of planet Earth may have been amino acids, lipids and nucleotides, the building blocks of RNA and therefore DNA. The dawning of life from a chemical soup. Once these molecules began to self-replicate, we have the opportunity for changes in their coding, mutations. These lead to the beginning of evolution, to the diversity of life on Earth. The primary mechanism for the diversification of life is natural selection by the way of selection pressure. The way that natural selection works is that we have thousands of little mutations in every generation. Most of them don't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. But occasionally, one of these tiny mutations give a very slight advantage to an organism in their environment. This means that they are more likely to survive and reproduce, which means that mutation is passed on to their offspring. After a very long time, these small mutations will inevitably add up to make big changes. It is important, however, to remember that there's no such thing as being more highly evolved or better. Natural selection usually works through selection pressure from their environment, their surroundings. So no organism will ever truly be the most evolved or most advanced. They can just be more suited to their environment. Eventually, selection pressure led towards multicellular life. This was the Precambrian era, which comprised 88% of geological time. From here, we're going to fast forward quite significantly to the Cambrian explosion at the beginning of the Paleozoic era 540 million years ago. This is where everything changes, when life on Earth begins to split into the mind-boggling diversity and complexity which we see present on this beautiful planet of ours. We do, therefore, with an increase in quote-unquote species, need to define speciation. Generally speaking, a speciation event has occurred when an animal is no longer able to produce fertile offspring with a related species. 
They have then become so genetically distinct from that other species to be defined as a separate species. This definition is not the best. Firstly, it stumbles into the problem of ring species, in which this concept completely falls apart. But it also fails to answer the precise moment in which speciation occurred. When we start referring to an animal by a different classification, for this question, we must answer an old question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The answer to this is actually relatively simple, but it relies on us to change the way we think about speciation. First thing we need is to understand is nature does not care about our human need to define and categorise. It really doesn't. Nature is not sentient, it does not have a goal or an agenda. The only way things will fit into our tidy pigeonholes that we want it to is by being incredibly pedantic. So let's get incredibly pedantic. I'm going to arbitrarily state that a chicken, by definition, is required to have a middle claw of at least 30 millimeters in length. Well, we now immediately have the answer to our question. The egg came first, as it contained the first of its kind to possess a claw, which was at least 30 millimeters in length. The creature which laid the egg was an animal which to the naked eye is indistinguishable from a chicken, but has a middle claw measuring at 29.9 millimeters in length, and is living in an environment where there is a positive selection pressure towards a longer claw. That does, however, leave us with the question of what happens if that selection pressure continues. If every generation has a marginally longer claw, eventually we'd have to arbitrarily assign an upper limit to the claw length of a chicken and define a new animal. And that isn't even accounting for the unimaginable amount of other tiny mutations and changes happening to a species over an extended period of time. In truth, Without arbitrary definition, there is no such thing as a point of speciation, only branching diversification. We are all the same animal, ever-changing, generations finding new ways to split apart from one another in a battle to be the most suited to our environments and survive. But we're straying away from our timeline, so let's go back to the Cambrian explosion 540 million years ago where at last life is advanced enough to significantly diversify. This was the beginning of the age of invertebrates. Pressure to survive had allowed a few very advantageous mutations to thrive. This has led to the development of the first shells, animals which had the mutations for a thick chitinous exoskeleton, had more protection, more chance of survival and more opportunities to pass on their genetic code. Creatures like trilobites ruled this era. This was a fantastic structure for survival, and in fact it still is. The niche which they filled is still filled today by crustaceans and shellfish. There were, however, other niches to be taken advantage of. Ones which could take advantage of the full height of Earth's oceans, and not merely the bottom of the sea. As we move into the next period of the Paleozoic era, the Ordovician, 490 million years ago, we see the emergence of the very first vertebrates, fish. This, as you can imagine, was an evolutionary breakthrough. These new animals were less dense and more agile, allowing them to take full advantage of the depths of the oceans. This previously unclaimed territory allowed the fish to rule all but unchallenged due to the sea. However, on land, a revolution of a different sort was taking place. At the beginning of the Silurian period, 443 million years ago, the emergence of the very first land plants. This group had long since been at the bottom of the food chain in the oceans, photosynthesizing algae being an abundant source of food in the sea. But now coastal algae had begun to root further inland, now with less filtered sunlight, nutrient-rich soil, and a heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere on the warm, young earth. The plants thrived and began enriching our atmosphere with oxygen. But let's turn our attention back to the seas, 
as we draw into the Devonian period, 417 million years ago, and see how the reign of the fish has grown. Now we get to one of the first true super predators of the Kingdom Animalia. Pictured here is a fish called Dunkleostus. Dunkleostus was a one-ton, 20-foot-long, armour-plated fish with a bite force estimated at about 1,500 psi in larger individuals. Dunkleostus was a placoderm, a group of armoured fish which ruled the oceans during the Devonian period. Here is where teeth, as an advantageous adaptation, first developed. The armoured plates in the front of the mouths of placoderms served very well for slicing through food. Individuals with sharper and stronger edges on these plates survived to reproduce, and this element has continued into most vertebrates. And this is still true with us. Within our mouths, we have teeth. And these are no more than specialised, highly derived scales. However, fish were not done diversifying yet. There were other niches to be filled. Towards the end of the Devonian, the fish branch split into distinct groups. On one branch, we have cartilaginous fish. This group has survived to today in the form of sturgeon, rays, and of course, sharks, who fill their niche as apex predators so well that their general body shape has barely changed since the Devonian period. The other branch is that of bony fish, you know, goldfish, carp, salmon, and so on. And of course, our ancestors stemmed from this group. Our ancestors were not, however, the first animals to leave the seas. That accolade goes to the arthropods, which evolved into the first insects and other land-based invertebrates. This was the comparatively brief and rarely counted age of insects. Arthropods grow to the size allowed by oxygen absorption through their exoskeleton. Plants had been growing without anything feeding on them for a lengthy period of time, so the oxygen content of planet Earth was high at this point. So after some time through the late Devonian and early Carboniferous period, invertebrates grew enormous. There were specimens such as Meganeura, a dragonfly with a foot-wide wingspan, and indigenous to what is now Scotland was this monster, Arthropleura a seven-foot millipede. However, at this time, at the dawning of the Carboniferous period, 354 million years ago, our slimy, fishy ancestors dragged themselves for the first time into the open air. This was the age of amphibians. We took our time then, adjusting to life outside of the water, steadily diversifying and adapting to a new environment, dwelling in swamps whilst ever attempting to move further and further from the comfort of the water. Plants at this point were also going through somewhat of a revolution. Until this point, plants had been only soft fibres, cellulose, but then a mutation led to the production of this chemical, lignin. Lignin is the structure which provides strength to wood. This allowed trees to grow to enormous sizes, never before seen in any organism. This did, however, lead to another consequence. Coal. And trust me, as a Welshman, I know all about coal. Uh, the reason for the formation of black gold, as we call it here, is that no species of bacteria had yet evolved which could break down lignin. Until this point, there was no need for it. This meant that wooded plants which died would fall to the ground and not really decompose. This material piled up, building in weight and began to crush the deeper material, squeezing together the carbon atoms within the cellulose, which had previously been protected by lignin. After hundreds of millions of years, what we've been left with are these lumps of compressed elemental carbon. 80% of coal on Earth is from the forests and swamps of the Carboniferous period. But turning our attention back to how the vertebrates were doing, we found that in the mid-Carboniferous period, around 323 million years ago, their scales had thickened, hardened, and dried. This allowed them to retain water within their bodies, 
allowing them to move away from the moist swamps and coasts and take over the rest of the world. These were the first reptiles. Reptiles grew larger, armed with sharp teeth and thick scales. They easily overtook arthropods and remaining amphibians to become the dominant group of animals on planet Earth. We're now entering the Permian period, 290 million years ago. In this period, we see the extinction of trilobites and many other marine animals, as well as the rise of reptiles. This marks the end of the Paleozoic era. We are now entering the age of reptiles. The primary line of reptiles to gain prominence is that of the archosaurs. This group branched off in several directions as we enter the Mesozoic era, which began with the Triassic period 248 million years ago. Some being dead ends and others dying off. Others found their ideal niche and have remained barely changed to this day. Some took to the skies. A similar technique of attempting to find an unused niche. However, it would not be this line, the pterosaurs, which would eventually own the skies. But we'll get back to that. Others, however, found their niche in walking upright with their hips below them, the dinosaurs. They would rule the Earth from the beginning of the Triassic 248 million years ago until the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago, and their descendants still roam the Earth to this very day. But this is not their story. So instead, let's check back on how the plants were doing. Towards the end of the Cretaceous period, the first flowering plants evolved. This was a very important step for plant life as this allowed them to have a symbiotic relationship with insects and small animals. This meant that despite being stationary organisms, they can now spread far further in their reproductive cycle. But the dinosaurs are not our ancestors, and needless to say, neither are flowers. Therefore, we're going to rewind back to the Permian period. Here is where we branch off. Instead of stemming from the archosaurs, we descended from a group of reptiles called pelicosaurs. Pelicosaurs had a strong sense of smell, lengthy canines, and derived long scales which formed tubes and were excellent for insulation. These pinko fibres were the earliest form of fur. This was nearly our time to become the dominant group, but the dinosaurs got there first. This meant that our ancestors had to be small to survive. These were the first mammals, living in burrows, feeding on insects, dinosaur eggs, and sometimes dinosaurs young. All the while, staying low, remaining hidden from the predators which would make a quick and easy meal of a small rodent-like prehistoric mammal. This life of secrecy did, however, allow us to diversify. Some remained in burrows, others hid in the undergrowth, groups taking to the swamps, living a semi-aquatic life. Some even took to the trees, going so far as to glide across long gaps with flaps of skin. The descendants of these lines can still be seen today, and these lines may not have branched much further if it wasn't for a certain incident 65 million years ago, marking the end of the Cretaceous and to the Mesozoic era as a whole. An asteroid the size of Mount Everest crashed into what is now Mexico, wiping out the vast majority of life on Earth, with larger animals being far more susceptible to consequences of this event. Some dinosaurs survived, those who were smaller, more adaptable, the ones who could deal with the sudden lack of food. They would of course go on to become modern birds, a group of animals which, by the modern day, have vastly diversified, however are best known for being the modern rulers of the sky. But this was now our time. The destruction of the majority of life on Earth marked the beginning of the Cenozoic Era and the Paleocene Epoch 65 million years ago, and the dawning of the Age of Mammals. This is when we finally took over. 
As plants regrew, herbivorous mammals thrived, unchallenged by other groups. This, of course, allowed carnivorous mammals to prey on them without competition. Without large reptiles dominating the oceans, small wolf-like mammals took to the waters. Over time, they adapted to their aquatic environment, to the point of being unable to return to land. These creatures grew larger, the ancestors of modern cetaceans, dolphins and whales. This, of course, led to the evolution of the single largest animal to ever exist on planet Earth, the blue whale. Life on land, however, continued to diversify. By the Eocene Epoch, 54 million years ago, life was starting to resemble life as we know it. Groups of animals we see prominently today are in existence, albeit looking a bit on the strange side. But we also see these primates. These unassuming arboreal mammals will play an odd role in Earth's future. Moving on to the Oligocene Epoch 33 million years ago, mammals had now grown enormous. This specimen is Paraceratherium and would have weighed in at about 12 tonnes. It is believed to be a relative of the rhinoceros and fills the same niche as modern giraffes. Now we reach the Miocene Epoch 23 million years ago. At this point we truly, truly see a resemblance to modern life. And then, 5.3 million years ago, in the Pliocene Epoch, a primate stood upright. Australopithecus. They were cunning. That was their main advantage in their environment, not strength or speed. And it served them well. So, of course, the cleverest went on to reproduce. We now have selection pressure for intelligence within this line. And this continued. Here we have the phylogeny of humanity, our line. Quite early on, chimps branched off from us, but our line had quite the uh, number of alternate branches as well. But then, the hominid line had the most important revolution in the history of planet Earth since life became multicellular. They harnessed fire. The importance behind this is simple. Meat. It's often debated as to what separates humanity from other animals. And in truth, the answer is cooking. Raw meat is actually quite strenuous to process. Many carnivores require lengthy naps after feeding in order to process their food. However, cooked meat is far easier to process. This means that we now had far more time on our hands. And time is by far the most valuable commodity in society. But almost as importantly as that is protein. With an increase in protein within our diets, we could now dedicate more of it to developing things which aren't just about fighting or running away. This is the point where the human line became really rather clever. And with cleverness, high protein diets and time comes efficiency. We became more sedimentary establishing camps, building shelters, keeping animals for food. We see the spark of creativity at this point, as humans began to adorn themselves with parts of their kills. With this new stationary lifestyle, people began to plant crops. We are no longer hunters and gatherers, but instead, farmers. This is the point where humans had a surplus of that all-important time. Instead of focusing on survival, which was now pretty much covered, we could now focus our time on art, music, and individuality. Humans then began to wander further from their home in Africa. We spread across the face of the earth, establishing colonies, building traditions. Now they had time to contemplate the universe. This was the dawning of philosophy and science, the very reason for this video here today. And the rest, they say, is history. But never fool yourselves into believing that we're the pinnacle of evolution. 
Humanity in its current form has only been around for about 200,000 years. Less than a blink of an eye in geological time. This is merely our turn, like so many other groups before us. Also, never believe that humans are done evolving. Humans are taller and less hairy than ever before. Myself excluded on that one. But that was just a very brief look at the phylogenetic tree of life. The true beauty and complexity of this would never be able to be represented in a short video. But knowing that we have merely scratched the surface of the true story of life. That concludes this talk. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learnt something. Please do share, like and subscribe and carry on learning. Have an amazing life.